Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh And very good day to everyone So welcome back to SID3020 with me um, So today we're gonna look at uh, Just a tiny final bit um, For The sub-NF 2.1 Which is um, enzymatic um, activity Alright so activity activity um, So let's just proceed It's uh, final tiny final bit Okay, so when when you're talking about enzymatic activity, so what are the key differences between an enzymatic activity and um, when we're talking about doing a classical chemical reaction where there's there's no enzyme, it's purely um, based on um, reactants and you know um, and a catalytic activity, so acid and base and a product or metal, for example. When we're talking about these systems. Um, the main comparison or main differences between those two other than you know the elements that you are using in the reaction is the reaction itself okay and and what what do i mean by that is um we're going to look at um this info one by one so on the left hand side of the table is the classical and the right hand side is the enzymatic um reaction so the first one is um, the classical normally we we play with uh, proton and hydrogen movements okay so when we're talking about any reactions normally it's either static uh, for not not a normal reaction okay so we are talking specifically for um, catalytic reaction in this case um, so we normally place with uh, for example protons and electron movement remember all the arrows okay and then um, the protonation of say a carboxylic acid group that will proceed to a product. Um, however, when we are talking about an enzymatic reaction, it's more um, general, it's, it's the whole thing. So the unique enzyme design that pushes and pulls the electrons. So there's no like, you know, one protons coming in and then it activates the functional groups and then you have a product. It doesn't work that way. Um, as we uh, went through, so you do need to have a lot of things moving on, a lot of things going on, um, so that you can actually proceed with an enzymatic reaction. Um, number two is, it's a three-component reaction via a substrate catalyst equilibrium. So what do I mean by that is, normally you have substrate one plus substrate two in an equilibrium with um, a catalytic um, component so metals, protons, hydrogens, and whatnot, and then you have your product. Okay, so this is the main three component. You can have more, of course, but um, in the general terms, is you have a three components. Okay, um, and um, when you're talking about enzymatic reaction, on the other hand, it's more of a stabilizing um, the enzyme substrate complex. So as long as you have a, a reactant that can uh, form a stabilized ES complexes, then you can have your um, reaction moving on, okay, um, going pushing through. So, when we're talking about this, okay, um, in a classical catalytic reaction, you might need a high concentration of your catalyst, whereas in an enzymatic reaction, you just need a small amount, okay, why? So, uh, the reason being. Normally, when you're talking about metals, for example, when you have a metal catalysis, you need to have a metal, uh, a lot of metals. I mean, a lot more metals compared to if you have an enzyme, because metal can easily be oxidized. So when you have an, an oxygen present in your system, you have a metal, then you can get a metal oxidation. So sometimes that's why um, to avoid this, you need to have a very stringent system, a closed system, a nitrogen system, or um, you know, in a gas system where you have your reaction going on inside a particular reaction. Um, but as contrast, for an enzymatic reaction, normally you just do it in, in a normal environment, so in the room environment. So you have oxygens, you, you have um, 25 degrees, roughly 25 degrees Celsius, and high humidity, but your reaction can still um, uh, move forward okay um, so those are the two uh, key I would say the, the most major differences between those two um, is it, uh, catalytic reaction number three is um, catalytic activity via acidic uh, or nucleophilic or, or basic um, intermediary um, or it start off with the activation of um, 
of say carb- carbonyl groups for example or um, in another way for an enzymatic reaction it's more of a cooperation of catalytic activities and a lot of bond formations okay uh, we've looked at how for example um, last week about acetyl coa where the intermediary um, system is uh, a thioester but it doesn't work alone okay if you just have a thioester the reaction will not proceed as as what is shown so uh, acetyl coa is a coenzyme so you have another enzyme that actually promotes this reaction to move forward um, and um, you need to have a certain um, you know when we learn about coenzyme so the figure about uh, for example, you have an enzyme like that, and then you have a coenzyme that changes the uh, three-dimensional shape of the active site so that a, s- a substrate can actually enter and uh, proceed with a catalytic activity. And the final one is more on, um, everybody knows, uh, a classical um, catalytic reaction has a very low cell activity, meaning that it's as long as the substrate contains or the functional groups um, of the reaction it will proceed okay for example if you have an ethanol where you can convert an ethanol into a um, ethanoic acid okay it, it will just push forward regardless so if you have a pentanol this is pen butanol so it will do the same so it will convert a butanol into butanoic acid okay so it's non-specific so as long as you have the functional group that can proceed with the reaction that will proceed however when you have a um, an enzymatic reaction um it's it, it is slightly different okay um, and i'm sure everybody have already grabbed this concept because you have the two models that we uh, normally use okay the induced fit and lock and key model so these two models that talks about specificity um so those four are the main, the main key, key differences um, between an enzymatic catalytic and a normal catalytic, uh, catalytic reaction or a classical catalytic reaction. Uh, and of course, these are only the differences that when we're talking about the differences in terms of reaction. So there are a lot more differences, of course, right? So you have different metal catalyst or an acid compared to a, a whole bulky enzyme and whatnot. But <clears throat> we're not gonna go into detail for that one. Next, when we're talking about a re- the reaction itself, okay, when we imagine a reaction itself, so what are the the key differences between those two in terms of um, the arrows that is pointing between the product and the reactants? Okay, again, remember because it's a catalytic, so there is a very high chance that um, this uh, all this reaction proceed with the intermediary. For example, for uh, enzyme substrate, the intermediary is normally this, the enzyme substrate complex. Um, for uh, a normal chemical, is normally this, um, the, the intermediates that we normally draw um, in the reaction. In this case, for example, is a protonation of um, the uh, ester group okay, um, before proceeding to anything. So this one just stops the, the intermediates. So if you were to draw um, an arrow for these um, two different reactions, how you draw it? If you have a guess and if it's correct, then well done, okay? So uh, for a normal classical reaction, the arrow normally pointing, um, so the major um, component of the reaction is always pointing back to the reactant itself. Okay, the intermediates are normally very small and of course the intermediates and it can can either um, straight forming a product or it can be in equilibrium as well okay so so these are a normal classical um, catalytic reaction however for an enzyme substrate or enzyme catalytic reaction the arrow the equilibrium arrow is pushing towards the formation of intermediates um, and then of course the intermediates um, can either form um, straight away as a product or you know uh, one way uh, one way pushing or it can be both ways depending on the enzyme um, that you use 
Alright, so these two are very different. Why? Why do why do we say that they are very different? Okay, before we answer that, okay, um, just to to show you that um, this this uh, structural uh, intermediates uh, kind of like an a chemical equivalent um, enzyme equivalent chemical activation of this function group. Okay, so for for this structure uh, on the left hand side to actually move, it's kind of like having um, a very unstable structure like uh, an oxygen a triple bond oxygen with a plus charge so they are very unstable so you know that it will tend to go somewhere either go back or move forward so when we say about this okay we can say that the chemical reaction is enthalpically and entropically disfavored okay so uh, if you go back to gibbs free energy and first year chemistry when you talk about delta H and delta S, um, this type of reaction is uh, normally is enthalpically and entropically disfavored. So that's why the equilibrium arrow is pushing more towards the formation of a uh, for of of your, uh, your reactant instead of your product. Of course, it can move to the products as well, but it's pushing more um, towards is is more stable. Um, reactant than uh, the intermediates that can form the product. In contrast, when you are talking about the enzyme substrate uh, complexes, the enzymatic reaction is enthalpically slightly disfavored, but entropically neutral. Okay, slightly disfavored meaning that um, if you were to compare between those two, a uh, chemical um, catalytic activity and an enzymatic, so the enzymatic is more favorable. Okay. Um, more favorable or slightly disabled. So it, it depends on where your um, uh, putting the words is. Okay. So when you say something is disfavored, so it is. If you were to compare to us to another system, you can say that the slightly disfavored is more favored than the other one. So this is what happened. So an enzymatic reaction is more favored, more favorable reaction compared to a normal catalytic reaction. And entropically neutral because you know towards the other day, um, entropy likes randomness. Okay, it likes randomness. Um, and an enzyme in an enzyme reaction, you know that you are actually uh, disordering. So when you have a structure of water, for example, right? So remember structure of water. You have an enzyme, for example, in the middle. Okay, you have your enzyme, and then you have all the structure of water. Okay, so when you have a reaction going on. Of course, the structure of water needs to be displaced, okay? And when you displace uh, a molecule, you are creating um, a randomness. So, it's entropy. So, when you're talking about entropy, you create more randomness. It's a positive entropy. So, when it says here neutral, meaning that, you know, you are uh, uh, forming an, a more ordered structure at one point, but at the same time, when you're talking about the solvents, you are actually creating a more a random um, system. So neutral, so to say. Of course, if you calculate it, it can be neutral or, or it can be slightly positive or slightly negative. But in general terms, you can say that the entropy for an enzyme substrate reaction is more neutral. So that's why towards the other day, when you calculate the, uh, um, uh, if you were to calculate uh, the reaction in a very um, accurately or, or very theoretical, then you can actually see that the um, system is pushing towards the formation of the intermediates uh, for an enzyme catalytic reaction compared to a more classical ones. And that's all for the subheading of 2.1. So summary so far, what have we covered so far? We've looked at the definition of biotechnology and how biotechnology uh, applies in a chemistry system. Just a little bit, right? So we look at all the equation which involve a lot of um, uh, calculation uh, about chemistry, equilibrium, and whatnot, um, and we will look at a little bit more in more detail uh, on how <coughs> you actually proceed with, um, uh, you know, extracting out the enzymes, and then how you actually use it in the industry and probably in lab scale uh, manner. Okay, when we also looked at these four, uh, sorry, these three, 
um, biotechnological um, splits that is related to chemistry. So you look at the cellular technology, we've looked at, uh, even though it's very brief, okay, um, genetic technology and enzymatic technology. And of course, our focus is more on enzymatic technology. And then whereby the top two is a more an in vivo system, while the enzymatic technology is more an in vitro system. Okay, in vivo and in vitro. So those are the keywords that, that you need to use, that you need to understand. So what it means is that one system in, in yeah, the first two systems you are using the biotechnology um, techniques or in a cell or a living cell or tissue and whatnot, while the other one, enzymatic technology, is more on an in vitro whereby you extract out the enzyme and then use it in a different form outside of a cell. And we also looked at um, some enzyme characteristics. Uh, we looked at uh, the mechalis uh, constant, mechalis constant, and mechalis equation for kinetics, uh, where it talks about a little bit um, about substrate specificity and catalytic activity. So when you have equilibrium, what happened, this and that. Okay, we've looked at um, the enzymatic activity, the influence of pH, um, ion sensitivity, uh, um, temperature. Um, in a system, okay, whether it push it or pull, or what will it do to the um, overall reactivity of the um, reaction. We've looked at um, molecular weight, the influence of molecular weight indirectly, okay, because we know enzymes are huge, very huge, compared to a more classical um, catalytic system that we use uh, or that you have learned in the lab, like for example, using an acid or a base. Or in some cases, um, if you do any research, you might have used metals as a catalyst. Um, and also, we've looked at under the, the same sub banner, we've looked at different um, structural levels. So remember, primary, um, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. Okay, remember that. So please, please um, recall what are the key differences because um, previous quiz in the previous quiz seems like. Most of you guys did not grasp this concept. Okay, please go back and, and revise. Okay, what are the meat? What are the differences? What are the key differences between those two or, or all four? Okay, and finally, we also looked at um, substrate specificity uh, by looking at those two models uh, the uh, lock and key model and an induced fit. Lock and key, induced fit. Okay, and of course, there are a few more models that. Um, we that is available that is theoreticized but we did not touch it here due to um, time limitation okay so by that we have finished um, 2.1 um, and the subheading 2.1 and today we're gonna focus more on um, subheading of 2.2 which is isolation and purification of enzyme so um, I would probably estimate that this will take either two or three lectures Okay, so this um, today and um, next week, and depending on whether I finish, I will be able to finish everything by next week. Then we will look into an application of enzymes in the industry. So that will probably be either a two or one lecture, depending on this. Okay, so in total, that one will be four lectures. All right, and finally, we will look at the in vivo technology in one lecture. All right. And because you know today is only week eight, and um, today is only week eight, and normally you have until week fourteen to learn everything before your final exam, but um, due to the system change uh, because of um, the pandemic, so uh, I've said that on week fourteen you will have um, your alternative uh, summative assessment. Okay, alternative. Summative assessment. So normally your summative assessment is your final exam. Okay, but now we change it a little bit. Um, because if I were to do a final exam, then it will be in the final exam week, and I'm sure you do have a lot of more subjects that will that you will need to sit for your final exam. Therefore, um, we will do our alternative summative assessment in week fourteen. Okay, for my section only. And for Prof. Kalija's section, you will do the same thing um, in week 13. Alright, so uh, this is the current arrangement. So Prof. might change it, okay? But 
um, the current arrangement is like this so on week 13 you will do um, Prof Khalija's assessment and week 14 you will do my assessment so that's why we only have five more lectures and these four lectures I plan it to have to, to touch on um, these three uh, points all right so let's move on uh, we have about 20, 20 25 minutes so enzymatic technology isolation and purification so when you talk about enzymatic isolation okay so this is an overview and an overlook of the whole process the first one is of course you need to have a source of your enzyme so without a source of your enzyme how can you get the enzyme uh, of course you can synthetically um, synthesize an enzyme but when we're talking about a biology uh, biotechnological perspective normally the source is a living cell okay so uh, living cells so those are the general um, terms uh, i would say 99 percent okay uh, you can have a cell free system but we're not gonna touch about it it's more something in that if you are interested in it then you can go and and uh, or you can talk to me about it all right so you have a source um, and then from the source you do a, a, a process called a homogenization um, and then another steps of centrifugation then you can get your crude extract of your enzyme okay so um, even though this too looks very simple in reality um, it, it might be complex depending on what type of uh, system that uh, what type of enzyme that you are actually producing sometimes um, the system stucks here under source part whereby your living cell will uh, will not able to produce um, a high quantity of the enzymes or proteins that you actually want okay and sometimes these two processes um, needs to be optimized um, before you can actually get um, uh, a reasonable amount of product that you want okay because two is the other day you don't want to uh, process like one kilogram of a raw material to only get like one nanogram of enzyme so one kilogram of raw and then towards the end you only get one nanogram of enzyme so you want to avoid that so you you want to have as much um, product as possible from as low amount of raw material as possible so those are the principle of enzymatic reaction uh, enzymatic and sorry not enzymatic reaction enzymatic isolation okay and then once you have your crude product, crude extract, um, you're gonna do a precipitation process in a buffer system, and from there you can either uh, precipitate out something, and then keeping it, keep some of them in a the solution. So what it means is that, say for example, when you have, uh, when when your source is from a living cell, and you know, like us in our body, we don't have only one type of cell. And even if you only have one type of cell, this one cell can contain thousands or even millions different types of proteins. Okay, so um, imagine that when you have that as your source, how can you actually take out one enzymes of interest? So that's why it says here precipitation, and then the it can either form a precipitate or a solution, and from there you can do further um, steps to actually get. Um, your product and we will learn that now okay this is just an overview overview okay so let's go uh, and look at each step one by one so how can we actually an enzyme of course first is the source so what is the source for um, an enzyme of course the the best thing that you can do is if the enzyme is for a specific process that you know our body is doing it you can always extract from your body okay so but it's it's a joke uh, you, you don't actually um, extract it from a human you don't harvest anything from a human except for harvesting lungs you know because it, it helps people but otherwise you don't simply you know um, have a farm of humans like in movies where aliens actually came into the earth you know abduct some humans and then extract out the bloods and whatnot okay. it's it's not like that so uh, we don't harvest anything from human we don't harvest enzyme from humans other than for exploratory um research where you might extract our blood from humans you analyze 
what are the proteins in there, what are the enzymes, key components and whatnot. Okay, but those are two different things. So in general, when you're talking about um, enzyme isolation, the two source is either animals or plants. Okay, but today um, we are shifting more towards plants um, because this is un is under the um, sustainability umbrella, whereby um, animals are less sustainable compared to plants. Uh, plants is easier. So if you have a plant system that can produce the enzyme that you want, that will be easily extracted. And of course, um, we when when doing something like this. Uh, if you were to extract it for animals, there's a lot of um, regulations that you need, you need to go through. Um, like, for example, the animal rights, how do you feed the animals, and so on and so forth. But if you were to extract it for an, um, from uh, plants, so there's very less regulation other than you know a regulation that looks at the purity of your extract and whatnot. So, so that's why um, today in our modern world is the soils are mostly animals and plants um, uh, but we still have a lot more um, enzyme extracted from animals than plants uh, even though we do have now alternative a lot of alternative okay um, say for example if you're talking about insulin that can um, uh, process in the condensation of glucose into um, our storage unit in glucagon okay um, Previously, when, when insulin was first discovered, when um, human who had diabetes, uh, companies actually isolate um, the insulin from an animal, okay? So normally uh, from cows or, or pigs, okay? extract out the insulin, extract out blood, filter it, uh, do a lot of hormone processes, and then you get this pure insulin. And then this insulin can be actually injected into humans and you know people with diabetes can actually survive longer using this technology. But nowadays, um, there are um, research that focusing on production of insulin in plants. Okay, because as you uh, might know, or if you have not known, so insulin is a quite small enzyme. So, um, if I'm second, it's roughly about 80 amino acids. So it's, it's quite small. And, um, from this two, from from this um, whole AT amino acid, they actually split into two chains. Okay, there are two chains for insulin. Um, one if I'm mistaken is roughly about thirty ish. The other one is about forty ish. So that's why I say it's about around eighty. So these two um uh, chain of peptide can individually be produced in a, a plant system, and then extract out, and then combine in situ or in in the lab or in you know, in the in, in industry to form a synthetic um, insulin. Okay, so we are moving towards that uh, because of course plants, you can easily grow them and harvesting is no issue and it's more sustainable um, compared to animals because animals, you need to slaughter the animals and then um, if you slaughter them, you need to, ha you probably use like a small component of the um, animals to actually uh, extract out your enzyme but what happened to the rest so what happened to the body to the meats to this and that so they are less um, sustainable but for plants if you were to be uh, if you were to able to generate uh, or genetically modify a plant that can produce an enzyme of interest so um, f and plant fr grows from one cell so if this one cell contains that protein when it grows into a big tree not, not very big of course when it goes, uh, grows, um, each component of the um, uh, the plant contains or will contain a certain quantity of the enzyme of interest. So you can actually harvest everything um, to get more um, enzyme from a, a plant compared to an uh, animal. Okay, so this is under the subject of plant biotechnology, and that's why in UM we have um, a center called Sebar. Okay, so center for uh, biotechnology uh, CE is the center center for biotechnology and agricultural research so agriculture is plant uh, B is for biotechnology so this is what they do okay um, so even if you have the, the enzyme from animals and plants of course 
they must have a high similarity to um, whatever purpose that you want. Okay, if say the enzyme that can catalyze the reaction comes from human, from a human blood. So if you were to extract the the enzyme from uh, animal or plant source, you want the enzyme to be as similar as possible so that you can get less side reaction. Okay, um, and of course you can achieve this by cellular modification or genetic engineering. Uh, of course it is also under our our biotechnological uh, umbrella, but um. We're not gonna touch about it. Okay, it's it's too biology, so we we are not gonna touch about it. Um, and of course, this allows for production and an almost exact match of a, a a human protein or whatever protein that you want. So if the protein uh, actually comes from say a worm, then of course if you know genetics, you can actually extract out the gene sequence for that particular protein. You put it in an animal or uh you put it in in plants, then voila, you can get whatever you want. Okay, so that is um uh, either the umbrella of source, so that should go there. All right, so now it's the second process, homogenization. So what is homogenization? So when you have a cell, when you have an intact cell, okay, and then this cell contains the the um enzyme of interest. How do you actually extract out? So the process is called homogenization where it's a mechanical process to break down the cell so you break down the cell so either a normal cell or if it's a from a plant cell say where you have a cell wall and whatnot okay so this is the basic structure if you have not if you have no idea about how a plant cell looks like it's something like this okay so this is uh, similar to our cell that one but the key differences is you have a cell wall cell wall okay uh, surrounding each individual cell so that uh, makes plants very um, strong and, and sturdy okay so because uh, you, you have your enzyme or uh, proteins of interest inside the cell so of course you first need to break the cell wall and to break the membrane cell before you can actually expose the enzyme um, to a more common environment uh, where you can extract. So the homogenization process is a process where you give out a strong mechanical uh, force to break down uh, either the membrane or the cell wall. Okay, so it's a technique used for both plant and animal sources. Um, but the the homogenization process or the equipment that you can use are totally different um so uh, for a cell um uh, i can't really remember the the equipment name on top of my head but uh normally you uses um uh, pressure is enough okay so this one you can use the pressure to to actually break down this uh cell wall but uh for uh, plant sources you need to first have a more mechanical um, we call it uh, grinding ball bearing ball bearing grinding or something I uh, can't really remember the, the equipment name but what it does it is is you have a lot more a lot of these uh, metallic balls and you have your plant source so the equipment what the equipment does is it it shakes um, your uh, plant sources and this mechanical ball so it's kind of like you know when when you do cooking you, you use lesung batu to you know crush all the um, onions and whatnot so the same thing applies here so you actually use these ball bearings to actually crush the plant so that you you kind of like break down the um, integrity of the plant before you can proceed okay so why they are different of course because of energy uh, when you have a cell um, the energy is stored in the cell membrane is less than energy stored in um in the cell wall cell wall has more energy uh it's more sturdy so you need to go about the barrier before you can actually destroy this okay and at the same time um so i've already talked about cell wall versus membrane okay so i'm gonna skip about that and then at the same time um when you are doing your mechanical process you need to think about will the enzyme get damaged so that's why there are a lot more processes or steps that you can actually use uh, to actually minimize the damage that it can cause to the enzyme. 
okay because remember to the other day the enzyme produced here can easily be degraded so in our environment in our air we have a lot of proteases that can digest all of these enzymes um, so in water if you don't use pure water you have microbes that the that, that actually digest this um, enzyme so that they can get uh, amino acid as their um, what do you call it um, a source a food a food source for them so that's why when you do this homogenization process you need to think about this will the enzyme get damaged and how or what might cause uh, what, what might damage this um, the whole uh, the, the enzyme and you need to think about an alternative way an alternative way to avoid um, damaging um, an example is that you can use is freeze crashing so freeze crashing what you what it means by here is you use a uh, liquid uh, nitrogen okay or not not lithium eh? liquid liquid nitrogen you use a liquid nitrogen and you know liquid nitrogen has a temperature of roughly about minus uh, 80 degrees celsius if i'm second is a bit more uh, it's a bit lower but roughly about minus or lower than minus 80 degrees um, celsius so you actually froze everything okay Imagine um, if if you have not watched any videos about how people uses liquid nitrogen to crush stuff, you can probably go to YouTube, find liquid nitrogen usage, then you can probably find the video. So it's it's a similar concept. Uh, I would like to show it here, but I don't have liquid nitrogen at my home. Um, so it's similar whereby if you have a balloon, okay, you have a balloon, uh, you put some air into it, so the balloon will be flexible, right? So it's the same thing. The flexibility of the balloon is kind of like a flexibility of a cell wall. So it's very flexible. So if you just push it, um, at one point it might blow, but it might not blow. But the the size of the balloon that, that did not blow, if you put in liquid nitrogen or if you um you know if you put the balloon inside a liquid nitrogen um, solution where it's actually freeze, okay, you can actually crush the balloon very, very easily. Because the structural integrity of um, the, uh, the the balloon uh, or the cell wall are now different. So um, you freeze crashing it using liquid nitrogen and you can easily smash it into pieces. And the advantage of this is that when you have a very low temperature, uh, even if you have proteases or you have microbes that can actually digest um, all proteins and enzymes, um, at minus 80, all of these you know, elements they are inactive um, so one of the ways to do it is of course for homogenization process is of course using liquid nitrogen but of course but you know when you do something like this of course it will be more expensive than um, using for example in the, the ones shown here which is a machine homo homogenization it's like a blender and people actually do use blender um, as the one of the step for homogenization so you have meat for example if you want to extract an enzyme for meat you put it in a blender and then you just blend it zzz, until you get a, a very fine solution and then from the solution you proceed with the separation process okay um, so machine homo homogenization one is blender the other one um, but blender sometimes uh, you know because there, there are a lot of movement so heat pr is produced so um, some groups um, or at least in the laboratory scale switch to using um, a, a ball bearing method whereby it's it's more uh, kind of like less movement uh, but of course uh, blender is the industrial fav um, favorite because blender is very easy it's very easy to clean it's very easy to control and whatnot okay and the third technique is by using ultrasonication uh, because to the other day, ultrasonication can, um, uh, you know, if you control it, it can produce um, enough energy to break down both cell wall and cell, cell membrane. We are not, uh, for now, I do not plan to go into a very detail of each technique. Um, but if you do have time, then we'll probably go into uh, a bit detail. But otherwise, we'll just um, skip it for now. Alright, so once you homogenize, okay, so initially you have a cell, for example, and now you have a solution containing everything. Okay, because we have homogenized, we have destroyed um, the cell wall. 
Okay, what you do next? What do you do next? So next uh, process is normally centri centrifugation. Why you centrifuge? One, because all matter contains mass. So each component, um, for example, cell wall, cell membrane, proteins, and nucleic acid, they all have their own masses. So cell wall is, of course, is the heaviest, uh, and then followed by cell membrane, uh, proteins, and amino acids. So when you spin out this solution, so say if you have this solution, you put it in the falcon tube or conical tube, you spin it out, you, you, you uh, centrifuge it very, very fast, what you will get is you get four layers. Of course, the layers are not distinct. Okay, it might be distinct, it might be not. Uh, but you do have four layers, and the bottommost layer is which one? Have a guess. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, the bottom layer is the heaviest. Okay, so this is where um, cell wall normally resides, and then you have your membrane, and then you have your proteins, and then the top layer is normally you have your nucleic acid. But of course, uh, centrifugation is not perfect, so you you might not get, you know, if you take a very top layer, you might get um, nucleic acid plus some other materials. It's, this is just a basic example of the four major components in a cell. Um, so if you centrifuge this, then you can actually separate them out very, very easily. And, and centrifugation is a very quick and cheap process because you just buy the equipment once and then you can use it multiple times or thousand times. Uh, whereas if you were to um, straight away use uh, say for example um, a chromatographic technique okay so because you know you know you can separate things using chromatographic technique of course but in this process because the original um, process the original source contains a lot of other materials like cell wall or cell membrane so you need to remove this first before you can actually proceed to um, using a chromatographic technique okay so the advantage of using a centrifugation compared to a chromatography is one time time and out, uh, versus output so um, if you use a chromatography you might get a pure product straight away but the time that it takes for you to actually do it or probably the um, the processes need to be rep uh, repeated multiple times before you can actually get a, a reasonable high um, quantity of a pure product but for centrifugation once you spin it out you can actually get you know quite high amount of crude extract okay so you do centrifugation you straight away have a crude extract so very quick um, oops okay and then um, centrifuge also can enable separation based on mass um, as efficient or perhaps even more efficient than um, some chromatographic techniques because again chromatographic there's a lot of chromatographic, chromatographic techniques so um, centrifugation is one of the best um, and of course depending on um, the system that you have you might have a, a centrifuge where it is cooled down um, so that you know centrifuge is normally after you centrifuge something it becomes warm a little bit okay because there's a contact um, air contact between the spinning rotor and and the air so an expensive um, centrifuge might be one in vacuum so that's one thing so when you have something in vacuum then you have less um, uh, friction with air therefore less heat okay the second one some centrifuge actually has a chiller so it can chill down or uh, cool down the um, tubes uh, containing all your enzymes and whatnot so you kind of like inactive inactivate the uh, enzymes or bacteria or whatever you have there so that you can um, get as much product as possible okay and I just talk about heat so centrifuge heat friction okay friction so it develops a cold system or vacuum all right okay <clears throat> now we have a crude extract so how, what do you do with it so um, when you're talking about enzyme enzymatic reaction can you actually use a crude product? Okay, the answer is yes and no. Uh, of course, in, in the research when you're doing this, it's always yes no. Um, it's a no because um, if you were to use this enzyme in a human, 
okay uh, for example if you isolate uh, insulin and then you want to use it um, in, in humans um, with diabetes uh, or patient with diabetes so of course you cannot use a crude extract because um, to use this enzyme or any product used for human there's a lot of regulations that you need to go through before the product can actually be used in humans okay so that's the big no for can you use a crude extract um, but it, it might not be um, uh, what our focus is because towards the end of the day we are focusing on the chemistry side of the biotechnology so that's why I cancelled that one out so we, if you're talking about a, chemis, uh, a chemical point of view whereby you want to use this enzyme for a specific chemical reaction you it's best for us to avoid using a crude extract because um, side reaction may be observed or might occur and it's unidentifiable so that's a key point unidentifiable <coughs> for example if you extract out an enzyme and you know that this enzyme contains um, say hemoglobin and uh, the other one is say uh, host radish peroxidase to so peroxidase and hemoglobin so you know that hemoglobin involved in uh, a transport of oxygen so it doesn't really do any enzymatic reaction per se uh, but HRP is an oxidizer a, a enzyme that oxidizes um, a reaction so if you have these two um, uh, proteins or enzymes in, in, in the same mix crude extract then yes, the answer is yes, you can definitely use it for your research or for whatever you want but if say you have a, a proxidase A and a proxidase B in the same um, reaction whereby uh, proxidase B might act slightly differently compared to proxidase A so these are the types of um, uh, crude extract that you want to avoid okay so and, and of course intracellular proteins require additional process to break and to remove the nuclear membrane all right so that's why you cannot use a uh, crude extract most of the time of course it's always a leeway yes or no okay and uh, yes the purpose is not required do not require strict control for example for if you're doing an exploratory research whereby you just want to see if you do this can can you achieve this then you might want to use a crude extract because again homogenization uh, one is using a mechanical for example if you're using a mechanical so you have the equipment you um, just use it once and then you centrifuge again another equipment and then straight away you have a crude ex extract and you can just use this crude extract and see if there's any um, reaction going on if there's no reaction you know there's, there's not much money uh, spent um, along the way so you can get a different source and then do another homogenization, centrifugation, and then you get the crude extract, and then you test it again. And then if your second test now has, oh, uh, there's a little bit of activity. So what you can do is you can proceed uh, with the purification process, and therefore you'll get your product. Okay, you have two more minutes. Okay, so there is no one technique fits all. So there's always a lot of learning process um, that you can, you, you need to do it to adjust um, to finally get the exact, Thing that you want okay and then from the screw extract um, you put it in a buffer to precipitate out um, and uh, the proteins either the protein of interest or you extract out the the protein that you don't want say for example if you have protein A and protein B in a mixture so the precipitating process you can either if say this is what you want all right so you can either precipitate out uh, the protein A and then filter it and then you get a pure product or you can precipitate out B and leave uh, protein A in the solution so that you can do something else and and normally that's what you do you precipitate out the proteins and whatever things that you don't want and leave out only the uh, protein of interest in the solution okay um, so that's basically answering number one and number two an exact con uh, an extract consists of a mixture of proteins and a material so each is unique with distinct characteristics okay if you have two enzymes two enzymes have different characteristics a different pi um, so different solvating agent different surfaces so you can actually play around with your buffer solution to to um, extract out or, or to precipitate out one of the other two enzymes okay so it's it's similar to your unknown experiment in in um, organic tree whereby you have an unknown mixture 
and then you know you do a lot of processes you you protonate deprotonate to actually get out only one uh, and not the other so similar concept here so you have two um, or probably thousands of enzymes so you want to precipitate out everything else and only get like what you want okay so and and this process um, is normally used to separate out proteins um, um, so a protein in a solution is normally stabilized by a repulsive electrostatic so if you recall the layer whereby um, you have multiple layers um, the layer is normally just two okay so this is say for example if you have a cationic uh, surface proteins um, and the stern layer of course the first layer that you have is the the counter charge for your um, original surface okay so when you have this system imagine if you have oops if you have um, proteins so you have a stern layer here that um, cause a repulsion between individual protein so the, the proteins is kind of like stabilized in the solution okay additionally you you also have a hydration layer because of course when you have a buffer um, or in the solution in our biological system normally we, uh, 70 percent of our body is water so you have water in, ev in surrounding everything so when you have something like this um, so if you were to precipitate it you need to do it very very slowly because if you do it too fast you might denature the enzyme um, so you precipitate it uh, steadily or slowly by reducing the forces and the hydration layer okay remember the forces that that pushing and pulling um, the uh, enzyme individual component so that it is stabilized in water so what you do is you um, add in uh, a precipitating agent to you know remove or, or reduce the barrier between um, the the two proteins or two or more of course and and the the um, hydration layer so that these two protein can finally come into contact forming a nucleation uh, step and it will grow and precipitate out okay um, and this process is normally repeated multiple times to actually get a reasonable uh, refined extract that you can uh, finally use uh, for chromatographic techniques okay so refined extract, this is the one that normally you want. You can also, as I mentioned, you can also use precipitate, but normally this is what you want because you can easily proceed with um, uh, chromatographic purification. And uh, of course, once you purify it, you want to analyze when you want to analyze using LCMS or NMR or any other techniques or GCMS, not, not GCMS of course, because proteins are enzymes are normally heavy. So normally LCMS is the main choice. Um, so an LC is a liquid. So if you have something in a solution, you can easily you know proceed with um, analyzing it in an LCMS. Um, we do have a bit more slide, but we don't have. We have about um, two more minutes, so I'll just go um, straight. So enzyme purification. So the refined extract sometimes is not enough uh, pure for biologic biotechnological purposes for uh, a chemical reaction. So you normally purify them even further. So how do you purify them? So there are two main types of um, separation techniques that you can use. Uh, first one is molecular size separation. Okay, and the second one is more based on affinity technique. And of course, you do have others um, but not, that does not fit into these two uh, different categories. So ultra, ultra filtration, dialysis, um, and it's very common for neutral proteins so a protein that you um, that is generally found in plants you just want to extract out uh, but say if you have a genetically modified proteins so you can actually modify it so that you can switch into affinity technique instead of using a, a molecular size separation why because affinity techniques is more spe specialized more specific so you can actually get a better yield um, by using affinity techniques compared to a molecular size uh, separation. So what is this molecular size? How is molecular size separation and affinity techniques different? So these are some, uh, so this few slides is talking a little bit about the techniques, okay? So uh, for a molecular size separation, such as ultra filtration, dialysis, size exclusion chromatography, so of course you do know about SEC, okay? So I'm not gonna talk about it, but this is an example of an ultra filtration 
So what it does is it extract out the exact size or molecular weight using a distinct membrane. So um, as shown in this picture down here is that you have a membrane of a hundred um, kilo Dalton uh, filter. So what it does is you 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 have this filter, um, and then you centrifuge it. What it does is that um, if you can actually see, there's actually a layer left behind. Okay. So you have um, the, 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 the product of interest. So these are all um, products that has uh, less than 100,000 kilo Dalton in molecular weight. Okay, so these are the product of your interest, something that you want. And, and normally what you do is, once you put it in, you add in more medium like this, and then you centrifuge again to actually get, because sometimes when you have less, uh, volume of solution you create nucleation uh, but we also trap some of the product so you add medium and then you you spin it again to get as much product as possible okay so ultra centrifugation is this step where you have a membrane so uh, you have a membrane and then second one you centrifuge it uh, membrane with uh, we call it molecular weight cut off and then you centrifuge it so that you can get um, the extract um, that has a particular molecular weight. So if you know your enzyme has say 95,000 molecular weight, if you use this using 100,000 a kilo Dalton, uh, 100 kilo Dalton filter, then you definitely know that your product is filtered out. Okay, uh, and vice versa if you know that your uh, enzyme is for, for example 500 kilo Dalton, so you use a 500 kilo Dalton filter or 4, uh, 400 kilo Dalton filter and then you can get your product from uh, the top layer okay so that's the basic technique uh, the, the basic principle behind ultra centrifugation and then for affinity techniques is um, the most common one because as I mentioned it's for a genetically modified enzyme so what you do is normally you have an enzyme with histidine tag so what it, what, what it means by histidine tag is that you have um, uh, six histidines extra so uh, again if you if you have a, a protein um, uh, chain okay you modify it so that you have histidine um, six histidine at the end and what it does is that by uh, if you look at the second picture over here you can actually have a column whereby it has a nickel bit in there and um, histidine, if you look at the, the structure of histidine, it's actually a chelating agent. Okay, remember chelating agent? So, like EDTA, for example, where it chelates metals. So, same thing, histidine is an amino acid that likes to chelate uh, metals because of its. So, histidine tag, so um, the histidine that I mentioned, where you have a lone pair, and this lone pair can actually bound to uh, a nickel or a different metal depending on what you choose normally it's nickel metal that is uh, normally used and uh, and therefore you can actually uh, if you look on the, on the second uh, a picture on the left whereby you have a mixture of everything so this one is your refined uh, protein extract because of the histidine tag so the protein that contains histidine tag which is the protein of interest will get stuck or uh, temporarily bound to the metal and finally, you can elute out a more uh, pure product. Okay. Um, um, so affinity chromatography, the most common is the intact, and then chromatographic techniques and and then chromatographic techniques. Okay, it's specific separation. Oh, I'm I'm talking very fast because I'm trying to. Um, never mind. I I have two more slides, so we'll just leave it at there. Um, we'll continue about these two slides next week and we'll add in more um, information about protein isolation and extraction. Okay, thank you. And this is exactly 59 minutes and 30 seconds. See you guys. Bye.